Hey, friends, thanks so much for tuning into this online gathering of Redeeming Hope. I'm so glad that you guys are tuning in with us today. And just kind of a reminder of what we're doing and where we're going as a church. Um, We are online every single week, but we gather in person monthly at the Clarksville Area YMCA. So the next in person gathering is August 29th. If you could mark it on your calendars, you can show up for candied bacon, for pancakes, for a good time together. We're actually wrapping up our sermon series that day. So we're going to be doing a live QA as it relates relates to the Holy Spirit and any questions that you may have as we've been exploring the Holy Spirit over the past 15 weeks. And we are in this series called Present, exploring the person, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit. We've been specifically looking at the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the follower of Jesus, and we're kind of wrapping that sermon series up over the next few weeks. So uh, just as a reminder of our vision and why we exist here as a church, Redeeming Hope, we exist as a family of faith that follows Jesus and helps others find him by living all of life as missionaries of hope. Now, what this means is that we want to unapologetically follow the life and teachings of Jesus, but we want to be really open to wherever you might be on your spiritual journey. And so to help us with that, we have four values that guide everything that we do as a church. So even if you don't identify as a follower of Jesus, you're welcome here. Even if you don't believe the Bible is true, you're welcome here. If you are hurting, you're welcome here. And if you have questions, you absolutely are welcome here. And I want you guys to know, even as we're only gathering together once a month in person at the YMCA, that we're still here for you as a church. And there's some ways that you can reach out to us. You can text us, 931-326-4512. You can email me, josh at redeeminghope.org, or you can actually find us on Discord. It's a communication app, and that's what our groups use. We have a Bible reading plan that we share our thoughts about what we're reading collectively together as a church in the scriptures, and that's also how our groups communicate with you throughout the week. So you can go to ourhope.cc slash discord to join our Discord channel. Also, If you would like to partner with us, if you'd like to join in the good work God is doing here in Clarksville, you can partner with us financially by going to redeeminghope.org slash give, or you can find us on Venmo at Redeeming Hope. Thanks again for tuning into this online gathering. So we're wrapping up our sermon series called Present, exploring the person, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit. And specifically today, we're looking at the power of the Holy Spirit to teach us to pray and to communicate With God. So, we're actually going to begin the sermon with looking at some pretty practical elements like defining what prayer is, what does it mean to pray, how our prayers can be helped or hindered. And then we're going to move into looking more at kind of the the theology behind prayer and communicating with God. And we're going to wrap up with a vision of one day in eternity, us dwelling intimately with God Himself. So, here's a definition of prayer to kind of begin our time together today. Prayer is a conscious, personal communication with God who has revealed himself in the scriptures and through his spirit. So we believe here at Redeeming Hope that God is three persons, one God in three persons. So God is distinctly three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we've been looking at God the the Son, Jesus, for the first year and a half of our church, we specifically kind of hammered into who is Jesus, the person and the work of Jesus. Then we took about a good like three to six months and talked right about God the Father and who God the Father is. And now we've spent, uh, I think we're at week 12 or 13, looking at deep diving into who the Holy Spirit is. And I want you to know that we can pray to individual persons of the Trinity. So God the Father, he has a will. He has a role within the Trinity to preordain all things and to accomplish his will through the Son and through the Spirit. So maybe um, if you would pray to him, if you are wondering if you're submitting to his will like Jesus did, right? Um, Then we see God the Son, Jesus. He has done all the work for us. He's paved the way for us to experience life and godliness and to come back into a relationship with God. He's paved the way for that, right? And then we see the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's work. He's interceding for us. He's guiding for us. He's an indwelling helper to help us, to teach us how to pray. He's even praying for us right now. So there's different ways that we can pray, but one of the ways is we can pray individually to members of the Godhead. So maybe if you're struggling to um, understand God's will, if you're struggling to submit or surrender to God, then I would suggest maybe you could pray to the Father, 
right? If you're struggling to try to save yourself or try to save others or be the savior for others, maybe you, you're taking on too much, maybe you're not resting, maybe you're not believing that Jesus has already done all the work for you, you feel an intense amount of guilt or shame from past sins that, or, or sufferings that have happened to you, then, then maybe it might be helpful to pray to the person of Jesus and ask that his work would be made real in your life. Maybe you're struggling to submit to the Holy Spirit's power within you. Maybe you are a follower of Jesus, but maybe there's certain things that you're really wrestling with. You have a besetting sin. Then it might help to, to pray to the Holy Spirit as well. So you can pray individually to members of the Trinity. However, we said that there's three persons, but one God. So God is three distinct persons, but he's one unified God. And so that means that you can, you can also pray to God in general right? And you can pray to all three persons of the Trinity at once. Maybe you can just imagine like you're sitting in a circle together with all three of them there and you can address all three of them or you can address one of them individually. So you see also how some of these problems like submitting or dealing with a besetting sin, you can overlap. And so that's how we can just pray to God in general. So just to to let you know how I pray. When I'm praying about a specific person or a specific issue, or maybe something in my own life, a lot of times I'll try to direct my prayer to one person of the Trinity to which that issue most closely relates. But if I'm kind of praying about general things, um, maybe about our church, or just just generally about people in general, or about Rachel, or about our family, I'll, I'll pray to God in referencing knowing that that means I'm praying both to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and kind of just knowing that I'm praying to all three persons of the Trinity. And then this is kind of the beauty and the mystery of God. He's three persons, but he's completely unified as one God. And there's different ways that we can pray because of who God is and how he's created us to be. And like I mentioned before, we're going to move to kind of talk about some of these practical things, and then we're going to look at some of the scriptures as it relates to that. And finally, we're going to see about God's vision for us and to dwell with us and to be intimate with us for all of eternity. So our main point for today is this, that as we walk by the Spirit and submit to his power within us, We are empowered to communicate directly and freely with the God of the universe. So just talking about three points today. We're going to talk about the definition of prayer, the outcome of prayer, and the purpose of prayer. So let's begin with the definition of prayer, instant and personal communication with God. So we're going to hang our hat on Colossians 4, starting in verse 2. Continue. This is Paul encouraging his friends in Colossae. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So it's really interesting. You know, you've got this Paul guy. He's planting churches all over the world. He's writing to all these churches. He's writing letters to them. And he's asking the Colossians, to, the people of Colossae, to pray with thanksgiving. And he says, not only don't just pray in general, but also pray specifically for me to have an opportunity to share about Jesus. And then actually, he also says, will you pray that my communication will be clear? Do you see how he goes from kind of the general to the specific with that? Just pray and be thankful pray for me, but also really pray that I'll be, uh, my communication will be clear. I'll be really clear on, on what Jesus has done. You see, so he's encouraging his friends to pray for him and he's giving them practical things to pray for, some practical advice. So as we begin to think through this, again, we mentioned that prayer is, communi- is, is conscious personal communication with God. And it's not just any God. That's why I add a little caveat. God, as he has revealed himself, both in the scriptures and through the spirit, because it's not just any God. And some people, especially in more maybe progressive cultures, will say that they're kind of praying to the universe or they're throwing thoughts out there, right? Or they're gonna pray to trees or mother earth, all those things. That's not what we're talking about here. To pray is to communicate, is to have a conscious personal communication with the one true God as revealed in the scriptures and revealed through his spirit. So again, just to define that, I just want to read it one more time because I think the definition of prayer is very helpful for us as we consider this today. As prayer is conscious, personal communication with God who has revealed himself in the scriptures 
and through his spirit. So really what I mean by this is just talking with God. It's just spending time with him. And it's very important for us to remember as it relates to gospel centricity is that God started this communication with us. We did not start the communication with God. We can read the Bible. We can see his words to us. We can look around us. We can see his grace in creating the world and this beauty of all that is nature. I, I was actually out today with my, my nephew, George, and we were out fishing on the Cumberland. And there was this beauty seeing the fish in the water, seeing the, the interplay of things, seeing the sun rising uh, on the horizon. There's just this beautiful grace and God is communicating to us both through his grace and specifically through his word. And when we come to him and communicate with him, we can have a back and forth conversation because he has started the conversation, both by generally revealing himself in the world, but also specifically speaking to us through the scriptures. And in this communication, we can be changed. Now, communications can take, communication with God, it can take various forms, right? Just like we can communicate with each other differently. And I was thinking about this as it relates to Rachel, right? Actually, Rachel's right over there. She's running the slides with, for me tonight. But I was thinking about this as it relates to how I communicate with Rachel. Sometimes we communicate and we're completely silent. We can be in the same room together. We can be kind of be doing different things, but we're just present with one another and that presence communicates our love and care and affection for one another. Other times, we have texting, quick communications. If you were to look at Rachel and I's text messages, you'll just find funny memes, grocery lists, and when we're gonna be home, right? That's all kind of what it's there. But we have this quick communication with one another. But then there's also, we have a rhythm, and we'd like this to happen every day, although it doesn't always happen, but we have a rhythm of intimate, face-to-face, -face, undistracted communication, where we have time together, without the phone, without the iPad, without television, where we can look at one another in the face, where we can talk with one another and have really deep, intimate time together. And then also, we can have communication while doing things together, like we're cleaning or we're cooking or we're doing something around the house or we're walking the dogs or we're taking care of stuff outside, um, we'll still be communicating with one another. So I just want to give you a picture of this is what it could look like with God, right? You can have some really deep time with him where you set aside an hour. I'm going to suggest that at the end of our sermon where you can communicate in intimacy <clears throat> with God. Also, you can have some quick communication, right? Like you're driving down the road. Sorry about that. I had a cough. So sometimes we just have to do that. Hopefully the mic got turned off. And hopefully, more importantly, the mic is turned back on. So we have texting. We can have quick communication with God. Just saying, hey, God, um, I had a day off the other day. And it was just starting off crappy. I like broke a glass in the morning. I'm late getting breakfast for Rachel before she goes to work. And I'm just there. I'm cooking breakfast. I just stopped and I said, God, will you please help this not mark my whole day? Could you please just help me? Like it's that quick instant communication with God. And he really did. He met me in that moment and he helped me. And my day off wasn't, I really think that God sovereignly worked in my day off to make it better because it didn't start out well, but I prayed and I said, God, will you just please help me not mark my whole day off with this? And he was really kind and gracious and helped me on my day off. And other times we can just be alone in silence with him or while we're doing stuff, we're, we're doing work, we're serving one another. Um, we can talk with God while doing that too. So a couple of different types of prayer that I just want to give you. There's a, lot of, there's a lot more types than these, but these are kind of the big bucket categories for us to consider as we think about what prayer is. One is a uh, prayer of ascribing. This reminds you of who God is. So it's just literally talking to God and telling him who he is, right? So that's essentially saying, God, you're glorious. God, you're loving. God, you're gracious. Thank you for being merciful to me. And we see that all throughout the book of Psalms, which is kind of recording a lot of David's prayers. He's ascribing to God who he is. And really what that does is that God knows who he is, right? He doesn't forget. But we have a lot of times we forget who God is. So that really reminds us of who God is. Another time, there's prayers of consecration where you can pray over a space 
to be dedicated to God. When we go into the YMCA, I show up early and I walk through the space and I just pray that God would meet people there in that space. And every house that Rachel and I have moved into, we've come into the house and the first thing we do is we pray a prayer of shalom or peace over the house. We just say, let this house be a place of peace, a place of shalom for our neighbors and for our friends. That's a prayer of consecration, dedicating a space to God third, prayer of thanksgiving. It's really just talking to God about ways you're thankful to him, right? So this is really, again, God doesn't forget, but really what this does is this recalls to our minds what God has done in our life, providing us provision or shelter, loving relationships, a church family to be a part of. Finally, uh, there's a prayer of supplication. That's going to God and asking for specific things. This is implying trust. This is relying a security of identity. Like, like we're going to a safe dad and asking him for what we think that we need. And really this recognizes God as our provider. So when we ask God for things, we're saying, hey, I can't do this myself. I need you to help me. And actually, as it relates to those specific prayers, Tim Keller has a great quote as it relates to when we ask for things for God. He says this, that God will either give us what we ask for or give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything he knew. And so he's very gracious to us. He doesn't always give us what we want, but he definitely gives us what we need. And what we find too, again, we're working through some of these practical elements in the sermon to move into the more theological and personal. But the Bible also says that our prayers can be helped or hindered based on our actions. That based on what we do, our prayers can be helped and we can actually be drawn more into prayer or we can actually not want to pray. Our prayers can be hindered uh, depending on what we do. Look with me. The, The first way is that the communication with God, if you are a righteous man, has power. Look with me at James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So this is related to this idea of supplication, like asking God for things. And really, I believe uh, how I interpret this passage, there's different ways to interpret it. All I would say is that as you are walking with Jesus, as you are abiding with him, as you are spending time with him, as you are being changed by being in the scriptures, by by spending time with God through the Holy Spirit in you, that as you pray, your prayers will align closer with God's will for your life. So you'll start to see your prayers being answered. It's not that God will listen to you more than he'll listen to somebody else right? As if our prayers change God's mind. But what it does is we'll begin to pray for the things that God wants us to pray for. And we'll begin to pray in alignment with his will. And then we'll start to see our prayers being answered because we're praying for what God has already ordained to happen. You see, as we follow Jesus in righteousness and holiness, our prayers will align with God's will. And we will see them answered. Um, next, the Bible says that we can be filled with the spirit or we can quench the spirit. So I'm going to put up two verses on the screen here. And do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it says, do not quench the Spirit. Now, being filled or controlled by a substance which affects your mind, which affects your judgment, it actually limits your ability to be led by the Spirit. So a lot of times when people consume alcohol, excessive alcohol, or they consume drugs like marijuana or other substances that affect your brain, um, you notice that sometimes your inhibitions get lowered, right? Um, Your anxiety can have a chance to go up. And you'll find a lot of times you're making decisions while under the influence of those substances that you wouldn't have made otherwise, right? You just make less wise choices. Your inhibitions are lowered, your guard is down. And so in those moments, that those, the, the drugs or the alcohol, oh, those moments, they are the ones that are controlling you. And it actually limits the Holy Spirit's ability to control and dictate and guide your actions. And you're making that choice when you consume those substances. So like, and, and the Bible says about this idea of quenching the Holy Spirit, I want you to think of it like a fire, right? And you can either pour water on that fire or you can pour gasoline on that fire. You pour water on that fire, there's still something there, but you're going to lower the intensity. Or you can throw gasoline on that fire. You can pray consistently. You can be in the Word. You can abide with Jesus. And when you do those things, you're going to see the Holy Spirit begin to move in your life in a lot greater ways. You're going to have eyes to see. You're going to feel the Holy Spirit in a different way as you continue to feed the Holy Spirit and the holiness and the work of Jesus in your life. But I'm saying that you can be helped or hindered You can either quench the Holy Spirit or you can be filled 
with the Holy Spirit. Another interesting factor, which I found as I was researching this, is that you, how you treat your spouse actually affects your ability to communicate with God. Look with me at 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And that word hinder means to cut into or prevent or to be wearisome. If you are not treating your spouse well, you're not going to want to go to the Holy Spirit in prayer because you're going to feel conviction. And so you're going to be less inclined to pray if you're treating your spouse poorly. And so your prayers are going to be cut into. They're going to be hindered. They're going to be prevented. It's going to just be more challenging to pray and connect with God. And so actually working out your faith, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, loving your spouse well will help your prayers grow and thrive. And also how you are personally self-controlled affects your communication with God. Again, in 1 Peter 4, 7, it says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now, I have a mentor of mine that's just amazing. And he said, Josh, when you have the peace of Christ, you can have the mind of Christ. And so when self, being self-controlled, being sober-minded, not being controlled by substances, not being controlled by your anger, when you're sober-minded, you can experience the peace of Christ. And when you experience the peace of Christ, then you can have his mind, you can have his heart, you can connect with him in a deeper way, and then your actions will flow as you're connecting with him. So really what we're seeing, all of this has been talking about the, the definition of prayer is really instant and personal communication with God, which can be helped or hindered based on our activity. Secondly, we see that the outcome of prayer is real, powerful life change. So as we begin this, I just want to ask you some questions that I hope you'd say yes to. What if I told you today that you could have the following? That you could have a real lasting change in your life. That you could reduce your anxiety and your stress. That you could increase your thankfulness, your humility, and your dependence on a God that loves you. That you could actually see your empathy grow towards others, especially others who are challenging in your life. And finally, you could further God's mission, which is actually your mission for your own life. What if I told you you could do all those things? Would you like that? Like, would you like to have greater empathy? Would you like to have more peace and less anxiety in your life? Like, I don't know anybody that wouldn't say that, right? What if I told you that all of God's promises and all that power could be made real as you pray and communicate with God? So this is just, this is just a very short list, not all of it, but a few things that a conscious personal communication with God consistently done over a long period of time can do for you. The first thing that it can do is it changes us. You see, we don't pray to change God. He's already seen all of human history. He's ordained all of these things that are happening. But then why do we pray? We pray because we have a relationship with God. And as we have a relationship with God, we have communication with God. It actually begins to change our own lives. Look with me at Hebrews 4.13. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You see, when we go to God in prayer, we look beyond our own abilities and we look to God's action on our behalf. And so when we do that, we enter into a posture of faith. We enter into a posture of trust, which actually begins to change our heart. Um, uh, John Calvin said these words, prayer was not so much for God's good as it was for our good. And really, when I think about even my relationship with Rachel, you can't experience intimacy without communication, right? You have to communicate. You have to communicate well. If, if I weren't to just not talk with Rachel and just go off the grid for a couple weeks, what I'm really communicating with her is I don't need you in my life. I don't want you in my life. I don't want to spend time with you, right? But as we talk, as we communicate, even in small ways, they can be very intimate and special and beautiful. And God created us for intimacy and connection with him. And so as such, we have to communicate with him. And so the closer that we get to him, the closer we communicate to him, we are changed by him. So the first thing that prayer does for us is it changes us. Secondly, it reduces anxiety. So anxiety is prayer in reverse. Now I want to be very clear about what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about non-clinical situational anxiety. And I just very clearly for what we believe as a church and what I believe personally is that clinical anxiety, it's real and it's valid. And so some anxiety that we feel is chemical, 
right? Chemical imbalance. Sometimes it's related to PTSD or other medical issues. And actually, God gives us medication. He gives us doctors to help us with these things. And, and I don't want to be flippant with this concept of anxiety. However, many of us in our church struggle with non-clinical anxiety because of life's circumstances, right? And this is, this is what I'm specifically talking about with prayer. And I want you to see how prayer is the cure for anxiety. So really, anxiety is prayer in reverse. So anxiety is a constant fear that's always focusing on the troubles of this world. So instead of bringing God into our view, we bring anxiety and problems into view. And then what we do is we meditate on them. We set our mind on those anxieties. We set our mind on those things in our life that are not right, and we ruminate on them. So it's like we're praying, but we're, it's prayer in reverse. It's just self-centered situational things that we're just continually meditating and setting our minds on. And what that does is just pumps up our anxiety. It pumps up our stress. And really what we see is that prayer is the cure for non-clinical anxiety. And so it's, so what we want to do is we can combat anxiety with prayer and with thankfulness. You see, what, what prayer does is prayer focuses on God. It's not putting our head in the sand. It's not saying we're not going to understand or think about our problems. But what it does is it clarifies our focus and what we meditate on. So we want to acknowledge whatever issues or problems in our life. We don't want to ignore them. What we want to do is fully take them in, but then focus our mind, like putting binoculars on and focusing those binoculars, bringing Christ and what he's done for us into view. And in prayer, we are often reminded of who God is and what God has done for us. What we see is anxiety is prayer in reverse, but thankfulness in prayer is the cure for anxiety because what it does is it brings the goodness of God into view while also acknowledging the situations that are causing us stress. Another thing that prayer does is it promotes thankfulness and dependence on God. Look with me at Colossians 1.3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So Paul is saying, I'm thanking God for you. and I'm praying for you consistently. And my friends, I just got to be honest with you. A lack of prayer is a lack of dependence. Not praying, just like me not talking with Rachel for weeks on end, it would essentially be me saying, I don't need you to be involved in my life. I don't really want you in my life. I don't need to communicate with you. But what prayer does is says, I need you. I want you. I want closeness with you. And a lot of times what that generates is thankfulness. And thankfulness really is us saying, you have provided for me and I can continue to trust you to provide. And really what it's communicating is that we are dependent on God and dependent on what he has already provided for us in Christ. And that's why it generates thankfulness because as we pray, we see he's already given us everything and that motivates us towards thankfulness and increased faith. Another thing it does is it generates empathy. It's really hard to be angry. It's really hard to be vindictive for someone that you consistently pray for. Now, 1 Timothy 2.1 says these words, First of all, then, I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. And then he goes on to talk about praying for government officials, praying for people that were literally killing Christians. That's what he's asking them to do. It's crazy. Uh, but why he's asking them to do that is because it actually generates empathy. Because when you begin to pray for someone, you begin to think about them differently. You begin to think about them in a different light. And so we actually have a friend, Rachel and I have a friend of ours, that um, got really, was really irritated with someone at his job and was really frustrated with them. And so what we asked him to do was we asked him, hey, will you consider praying for him? So our friend prayed for his friend at work. Uh, he wasn't really his friend, prayed for his coworker. They ended up becoming friends. Um, our friend who was praying for him led him to faith, and now he's a, an integral part of our church family. Why? It all started with praying for someone that was getting on his nerves. And so really what it does is it generates empathy because it's entering in for them. It's interceding for them. And so I want you to pray for your spouses, your children, I want you to pray for other church members and even for church planters that get on your nerves sometimes, okay? Pray for me. Pray for us as we're planting this church together. Finally, and not finally, but just the last thing that we're going to look at today is a prayer furthers God's mission. Look with me at Luke 10 too, just one of my favorite passages. I think about it all the time. And when he said to them, and he said to them, Jesus speaking, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. 
Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So he says, the harvest is plentiful. There's plenty of people waiting. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray to Jesus that he would raise up laborers to go into the field to share the gospel. And then the very next verse, actually, he says, go. I send you a sheep among wolves. So he says, pray and then go. So we join God's mission as we pray. And my friends, one of the ways that I do this is I go on prayer walks around my neighborhood. Like our neighborhood has people that are broken, has marriages that are on the verge of divorce, has people that are really hurting. And and actually, I think the message of Jesus could give them true hope. And so I know most of the people in our neighborhood and I know where most of them live. So I'll go walk around the neighborhood and pray. And we've seen multiple people take a next step towards Jesus. And I think part of that is a result of prayerfully thinking about them and how to care for them well. So if you're struggling to connect with your neighbors, we do three questions at Redeeming Hope. What, how, who? So you read the text, you ask what sticks out to you, how is God calling you to respond, and who is God calling you to reach out to? And sometimes it's hard to think of a person that God might be calling us to reach out to this week. And if you're struggling with that, I want to encourage you to just go on a prayer walk. Just go walk and spend time with Jesus in prayer. He'll bring a name to mind for sure. So we see the second point is the outcome of prayer is real personal life change. And it will happen over time. And it will give you all these benefits, lasting change. It'll give you peace in the midst of anxiety. It will generate thankfulness and dependence. What it'll do is it will begin to gener- help you generate empathy towards people in your life that you're struggling to find empathy towards. And it'll help you partner with God on his mission for the world. Finally, our last point is the purpose of prayer is intimacy with God. My friends, you and I were created to walk with God. Adam and Eve were walking with God in the garden. They were spending time with him. He was spending time with them. Can you imagine Adam waking up after God formed him out of the dust and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? The first person he sees is God himself bending over him. He says, come on, stand up. He's helping him stand up. He's helping him walk. He's teaching him how to do all these things. Can you imagine the intimacy that Adam had with his father one-on-one? It says they walked together in the cool of the day every day. It must have been amazing. But what happened was is we ran away from that. That we we actually introduced brokenness in the world. And so we couldn't have that intimate time with God. We couldn't walk with him anymore. We were separated from him. And then the whole Old Testament is God choosing a people called Israel and he gave them every opportunity to reconnect with him and they kept running away. And then Jesus comes on the scene. He steps in our place. He reunites us to, as we follow him, he reunites us with our dad again, with our heavenly father. And then he sends his spirit to indwell us with power to truly, intimately, immediately communicate with God our father again. And what we find in the scriptures is that Jesus is praying for us. We talked about this uh, back four or five weeks ago when we talked about the Holy Spirit's interceding for us. Jesus is praying for us. The Holy Spirit is praying for us. The Godhead is pulling for you. They're fighting for you. They're working for you. And when we choose to believe the work of Jesus for us, when we have access, then we get access to this incredible power to change, to be on a path of being freed from anxiety into thankfulness, to join God in his mission to change the world. And all of this is pointing us to the day where we will be better than Eden better than just walking with God in the cool of the day, where God's going to come and he's going to dwell with us for all of eternity, where we won't have this. We can't really see him. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes when I pray, I feel like I'm just talking to the ceiling or I'm a crazy person, right? And and the, the scriptures, the truth of the Bible tells us that we're not, but sometimes it's hard to feel that way because we're used to physical touch, right? We're used to like people being around us and talking with them. And like I said, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day, but the Bible gives us a picture of a future, of a future where God doesn't just dwell with us for a few hours, but he dwells with us for all of eternity. And we begin to receive the beauty of all he is, and we get to reflect that beauty outwards back to him and to one another. Look with me at this beautiful picture of the end of all things. Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them 
and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And look at what happens when God dwells with us permanently and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. My friends, prayer is just doing with God in a short time what we're going to be doing with God in eternity, dwelling with him, communicating with him, enjoying his presence, and him enjoying our presence. We're practicing eternity. Eternity is coming into our hearts more as we pray. And we're engaging with eternity right here in the midst of of this broken world. And if you're joining us today and you look over the course of your life and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, that means that you can't point to a specific place in time where you've put a stake in the ground and have chosen to follow Jesus. My friends, God wants to be with you. He wants to experience intimacy with you and he wants you to experience intimacy with him so that you and others around you can change, can thrive, can be filled with hope, can be filled with redemption, can be filled with, guess what? A redeeming hope. He wants to introduce the hope of eternity into your heart right now, spending time with him as he changes you. And my friends, all of this access is offered to those who choose to follow Jesus. So all you have to do is hear the message of Jesus, the interaction of Jesus on your behalf, to believe that it's true for you, that you actually need this, and then to obey by making Jesus Lord over your life. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to intercede for you. Jesus intercedes for you. And then you have instant communication, access to God, filling with his power and with his presence and with the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you look over the course of your life and you have made that mile marker moment, you are a follower of Jesus. My friends, you and I, we can fall asleep to this power that's within us. And it's not about what we do, but it's about who we are. And we can't change who we are. It's only God can truly change us from the inside out. And actually, as we abide with him, as we spend time with him, as we communicate with him in prayer and spend time in the scriptures, he begins to change us. Our actions change when our heart changes. And our heart changes when we spend time abiding with God. And then what happens is that our prayers will be more effective because we're going to begin to pray about the things that our God has already willed to happen. So here's just a few practical steps to communicate, to have that conscious, personal communication with God this week. A couple practical things you can do to communicate with God. One, carve out one hour this week to be in silence before God with complete honesty. So put your phone on airplane mode. You're not that important, okay? All of us can put our phone on airplane mode for an hour. Put your phone on airplane mode. Spend time with God. Just talk to him. Be brutally honest with him. He can take it. If you're angry with him, tell him you're angry. If you're frustrated with him, tell him you're frustrated. Most of the Psalms are David saying, God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me alone out here in the wilderness while my enemies thrive? Right? So just be honest with your father for an hour. I'll tell you, you will leave so refreshed and so changed and so transformed. You'll be like a new person. Next, Develop a routine that blends with your normal routine to include communication with God. So that's, that's you and God doing things together, right? So like as you're brushing your teeth, as you're taking a shower, as you're getting ready, you're making the coffee in the morning, we all have rituals that we go through, right? We all have a ritual. We all have a routine. So just bring God into that routine. Just say, God, thank you for the coffee. I'm like, look at my coffee maker right there, my French press. As I'm making the French press, it's six minutes, right? So six and a half minutes, actually, for the best French press. And so when you're doing that, just say, God, thank you for this coffee. Thank you for this house that I'm in. Thank you for hot water, for clean water. God, just bring God into your routine, right? Like, that's, that's part of it. Just, just time with God, doing things together. And then also developing reminders to include God in your daily tasks and activities throughout the week. So actually, um, Rachel has done this, and um, I shared this at men's group, and one of the men in our men's group is doing this too, just putting little sticky notes, like sticky note in the bathroom. When you go in and you brush your teeth, just a little reminder, have you talked with God today? When you get to your work, just have a little passage of scripture on your laptop, just, just, just to remind you to just those quick little text message prayers like we talked about earlier. As we end our time, I want to introduce you to just one more quick story about prayer and how that changed someone at the end of their life. So there's a man in the Bible, his name was Stephen. 
He was the first Christian martyr. He served the poor. He preached the gospel. And he was being pulled out of the city to be stoned. They were going to literally stone him to death, throw rocks at him until he died. And so as they're pulling him out for preaching the gospel, he says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. He was gazing into heaven. He was looking towards where he was going. And he saw Jesus standing like the priests of old. Did you know that in the Old Testament, a priest was never allowed to sit while he was doing the work? Why? There was no chairs in the temple because the work was never over. And actually in Hebrews 8, it says that Jesus was seated at the right hand of God, that he's our high priest seated, his work is done. So Jesus sits in victory, but we also see very clearly here that he's seeing Jesus standing in intercession like the priests of old for Stephen in his hour of need. And Stephen looked up and he began to pray. And he saw Jesus himself in heaven interceding and praying for him at the hour of his death. And in Acts 7, it continues. And it says, And they cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses, they laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, throwing rocks at him until he died, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. And what it means by that is he died. So my friends, Jesus was present with his friend, Stephen. And Stephen knew it. And he talked with God, his father. And then he saw Jesus. He saw him standing, interceding for him. He communicated with Jesus personally, consciously in his hour of need. And he was comforted. And he was filled with the grace as he's being hit with rocks and being murdered for preaching the gospel. He was filled with grace to even pray for the very people that were stoning him. And one of those people that was letting it happen was a man named Saul, who later became Paul, who planted almost every Every single church in the New Testament. My friends, whatever you're going through, God is present with you right now. He sees you as his friend. He loves you. He wants to spend time with you. And he invites you into that conscious, personal communication with him. That will truly change your life. And as we walk by the Spirit and submit to his power within us, we are empowered to communicate directly and freely with the God of the universe. Thank you so much for tuning in to this online gathering and have a great week.